Welcome to Lessons from the Playroom. In this podcast, Lisa Dion will help you explore the little things that make a big difference in play therapy. Lisa is a founder of Synergetic Play Therapy. You know, sometimes therapists get all caught up trying to study big theories and mastering techniques to help children like me. But sometimes it's the little things we show you along the way that make the biggest difference. Join Lisa as she teaches you some of the little lessons that children are trying to communicate to you so that you can help us in the best ways possible. And on behalf of all the kids you work with, thanks for listening and believing in us. Let's get started. Hi, listeners. Welcome back to the Lessons from the Playroom podcast. I have been counting down the days to be able to bring this lady to you. I have with me today Jackie Flynn. For those of you that don't know Jackie Flynn, what an honor that today you get to be introduced to this uh, amazing woman. Jackie is um, a mover and a shaker and an innovator and out there doing really amazing stuff for the play therapy community. If you don't know about Jackie, uh, she is a licensed mental health counselor. She's in private practice, 100% teletherapy, which is why I've asked her to come on and be the guest for us today as we dive deeper into teletherapy. She is a registered play therapist. She is the founder of EMDR and play therapy integration support. She's a, an EMDR junkie. Should we call you that? Are you an EMDR junkie, uh, Jackie? You love it, love it, love it. <laughs> um, oh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> but for those of you, since you're listening to my podcast, would you please add on to your podcast list? She is also the host of the Play Therapy Community Podcast. She also every year does the Innovative Child Therapy Symposium, which is an amazing experience where Jackie is interviewing more movers and shakers in the field and, and bringing amazing training uh, to the, the play therapy field at large. So I really feel like I could just go on and on, Jackie, about you, <laughs> your mom, you do other cool stuff. Uh, I'm just super excited that you are here because you spend so much time interviewing people Mm-hmm. It's time for you to be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, what an honor. I, I could even have a hard time thinking after hearing you say those things about me because you know how much I think of you. I think uh, you're like one of the most influential people in my life right now, especially as I go through this intro uh, to synergetic play therapy training. So uh, thank you for your kind words. Well, wow. I couldn't think of someone that I would rather ask to jump on here and share some excitement and some uh, knowledge just to help our play therapy community continue to wrap their mind around this online stuff, which we've been really immersed in this for a year now since COVID hit. And I know that there are some individuals that have totally gone fully online like yourself other individuals that are still in the camp of, I hate it, you know, mm-hmm. others that um, are doing like a little bit of both. And I just want to keep this conversation going and really even offer some tips and some of some different ideas of things that um, clinicians can do. So let's just start with what made you uh, decide to really just embrace teletherapy and to the point where that is now what you do because you love it so much. And I truly do love it. I think um, even before COVID hit, I was working online with many of my clients. I'm a couple therapist as well. I practice Gottman Method Couples Therapy. And one of my um, jams was meeting with couples after their kids go to, goes to bed. So I'd, I was already familiar with the process of working online. And I really liked that. I've seen so many benefits. And then I noticed like throughout that work, there were some of the um, parents that I was working with that had some trauma. So I would then meet with them individually for EMDR, um, you know, every once in a while. So when COVID hit and um, we're presented with this, how do we meet with all of our clients online? I was thinking, well, can we do this with play therapy? Because I know online therapy is incredible, 
I didn't quite, you know, I hadn't thought it through with the play piece. And it, it turns out that the play is just as incredible. And there's lots of lots and lots of benefits, some that you can't recreate in the office. So I prefer it um, just because of the results that I've seen. And that's why I love it. I think just seeing the changes is like you have that feeling when you have an amazing session. It's like, Oh, I love this. And that's kind of what made me want to do it full time was like these sessions are incredible. Okay, Jackie, I want you to keep going because you just said that there are things that you're seeing that happen online that yeah. you're not able to get when you're in person, which I think for some of our listeners might be like, what? Because the tendency yeah. is to think that uh, that in person is better. So will you share what are some of the things that you have noticed that actually make it where you have a different and maybe even sometimes a deeper result from online versus in person. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say that some of it's shifted since I've gone through your training. Um, and one big piece is the predictability. You had mentioned in the training that predictability creates a sense of safety. And throughout this, you know, whole pandemic, safety is something that is is questioned on so many levels. So um, one thing that I can't get in the office that I get um, online is the family component at the beginning of the session. So many of my kid clients, we will literally start off the session. I'm looking for my bubbles around here. We'll start off the session with maybe like the parents and the, the siblings, and we'll have freeze dance party and bubble blowing party for the first five minutes where we're just blowing bubbles. They're popping the bubbles, and then we're, we're doing the freeze dance and then everything calms, everybody moves away, and then I meet with the child. So we have that predictability, but we also have inclusion of the family, and the family is such an, a big part of the child's life. So we can start off with that playful attunement, that connection, and really get them into their green zone. I think about like um, even looking at it through the lens of the polyvagal theory, we are like that social engagement is so very rich so that when we then move to individuals and with a five-year-old, they're in a different state of connectedness. They're able to kind of work through whatever it is that's troubling them. I can't get that in the office. I can't get mom, dad, little brother in there and certainly not in the state of mind. You know, usually they come after school um, where they're in uh, freeze dance and blow and bubble mode. So <laughs> that's, that's one example. Wow. So you're really using and taking advantage of the fact that it's already, you're reaching them in their home. So everyone is there so that you're creating a deeper connection and attunement right up front to set the stage to be able then to go into, into the work. You know what it reminds me of? I've got to bring up EMDR, but it reminds me of creating a sense of safety up front so that there is something that the child can then go back to or lean on as they go deeper into their, into their process, rather than like a lot of times in, in person, I mean, we just come right in and we just dive right in, but you're really creating this different experience up front. Brilliant. Yes. Oh, thank you. And I have to say that I'm, I'm so glad that in this transition that I took your training, because one of the things that I'm noticing that is strengthening it is me kind of being that um, authentic presence rather than, you know, just tracking them and mentioning kind of their mastery, which is incredible. And that's what I was doing before, um, like in my child centered approach as we're moving um, through the process, you know, many of them I work with through MDR therapy as well. But I'm able to kind of really mention my experience, like, oh, when you did that, I noticed the tightness in my chest. You notice it's kind of hard to talk right now. I could feel like tears welling up behind my eyes when you say that. And it doesn't matter whether we're on the computer, whether we're in person, we are together in that moment. And it takes it to such a deeper level. So that one is kind of hard to tease out whether that's just an online thing or, or what. But I know these online sessions are so powerful and having the family component is like incredible. Like yesterday I met with a teenager and the mom did the bilateral stimulation. She's a resource in her life and we have the electronic version where they can 
watch the ball or listen to the auditory or do the tapping, but having the mother's present, I, the presence, I think about like Janet Courtney's work on the uh, power of touch, having her do the tapping on her shoulders. It was so powerful. We were able to lower that level of disturbance and she processed through the target just, just by having the presence of her parents there. I don't know if that would have necessarily kind of panned out that way in the office. And I've done that time and time again with whether it's with the spouse, you know, my adult sessions or a parent or we're able to have them kind of jog through the the bilateral stimulation and then they're able to run over to their bed and get their favorite blanket and have that neuroception of safety right there that, I mean, they could grab a blanket in my office, but that's their home. That's, that's where they live their life. So those are some things that I, I don't quite, get in the office. I had some great sessions in the office for years, but this teletherapy seems to take it to it just another level. So for those of you that are listening and you're like, this is exciting. And what is she talking about with the bilateral? And Lisa keeps saying EMDR and now Jackie's saying EMDR. So for those of you that are not familiar with EMDR, go check it out. Um, it is a amazing, um, uh, intervention protocol to help children and well, and anyone of any age be able to integrate anything that they perceive as traumatic or a disturbance of any kind in their system. And what I'm loving that I'm hearing you say, Jackie, is that ultimately it doesn't matter what the protocol is and, and really even what the play therapy approach ultimately is, you're using, you're taking advantage of being able to bring in adults that can be co-regulators so that you've got co-regulators that are in the room in a totally different way that create another layer of support. And we know that when we have the support of a co-regulator, we get to go deeper in our process because we do have that additional sense of safety. So I just hear you say, I'm taking advantage of taking advantage of the fact that I'm in their home, I'm taking advantage that there's other adults around and I'm, and I'm bringing it all in rather than staying in this isolated experience, which I think some play therapists think that's what teletherapy needs to be. It's just me and the child at the computer. And we're just sort of doing our process together. And I'm hearing you go, Yes. And yes, yes. And bring, bring the rest of the world in too. That's what I'm hearing you say. Is that, am I getting, am I getting it? Yes. In, including like um, their resources. So suppose they're in their bedroom and I see like on their bed, they have like a pile of stuffed animals. And we know about like some kids and their stuffed animals, like each one is a resource and has the stories. Oh, I noticed that you have something on your bed. Can, can you pick out something that when you think about it, it makes you have, have, like that good feeling. And then you learn more about them. You learn um, kind of what, what positives, what negatives, relationships, where they got it. I mean, it's just it's, uh, seemingly like unlimited with the resources you can get from just being in their space. So that's another benefit. And a, another one too, is that, um, they don't need any transportation. Many of the teenagers that I work with, I will meet with them right after school and their parents aren't even home from work yet. So we're able to kind of still preserve their evening and have the therapy and get, you know, it's not as invasive into their schedule and their schedules are pretty busy sometimes. Mm-hmm. So are you finding that there are certain go-to things that you tend to do with different ages of the client? Mm -hmm. And, and, and if so, like, what are, how do you tend to think about teletherapy with littles versus maybe, you know, the children that are a little bit older and then the teens, will you just walk us through that a little bit? Yes, yes. Uh, developmentally, where they're at. So some people, when they think of teletherapy, they think, okay, my five-year-old is not going to sit in front of the computer for like an hour. And I'm thinking to myself, I really don't want to sit in front of the computer for an hour either. So we're literally playing online. We're dancing around, we're jumping. Um, like I may be hitting the bot bag, they're hitting the bot bag at the same time. We're doing mirroring activities. Um, we may be doing sand tray, whether it's the... Um, 
um, the actual sand tray with the sand in there. And they may, um, I send them out a therapeutic toy kit. So they have lots of toys and I have the same ones we could play together. So developmentally, um, we do more movement sometimes with the little ones. As they get older, certainly we, we can have movement. But um, like if I'm working with someone that suppose they're one of their big loves is uh, soccer or football. I'll have them bring whatever it is into the session and we'll incorporate that. So it may be kicking the soccer ball around the room while while we're kind of exploring or whatever the, the topic of that session or the focus of that session is. So um, with the older ones, they tend to kind of be more kind of um, um, kind of there in front of the computer. The little ones were more, more moving, um, more more actual kind of like playing with the bubbles or um, a lot of my uh, tweens, they love like artwork. So they have out the paints and the crowns and their um, toy kit. Um, I give them like modeling magic. We have a bag where they can draw like a positive resource on the front of it and keep all their stuff in it. We have um, Play-Doh and some kinetic sand and um, lots of little papers and stuff. So it, 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 it does look different across the ages, but even kind of gets more specific to that kid themselves because you may have a teenager that likes to move around too but a little one that just wants to sit there and then do crafts while during the session so kind of customize it just as I would in person so I'm hearing that for a lot of your clients you'll send them something you'll send them a kit of some kind do you find that that's really important that the the toys or the things they use in the session with you are only used with you because I know some clinicians are of that mindset. I know others are like, no, we can just use whatever. I'm just providing something for them. So they actually have a, an option where, how do you think about that in terms of the things that they would use? That um, continuum of the rigidity chaos just came in mind. It's like right in the middle because sometimes they have stuff that I didn't send them that is like amazingly appropriate for what we need. Um, and then sometimes um, what they have is, you know, not, you know, not as kind of appropriate or fitting as what is in the box. But I do like to keep what I send them specific to the session because uh, I, I, it's not just a random kit, like a box that I just pull out. I make the kit up specifically for that client. So during the um, intake um, and in the EMDR therapy, we call it the history taking. I really look at that client's um, uh, resources, what they like, what they don't like. So one client may get like a whole plethora of like Pokemon figurines and another one may get little glitter pins and it's really fun. I love it. <laughs> Whatever I'm not spending in my office rent, I'm spending on these boxes. <laughs> but um but if they have it out, there's some of these um situations are very chaotic. So if they have it out throughout the week, then it's not available during the session. It may be scattered or thrown away or just lost. So one thing I do tell the um, parent, when you receive the box, put it um, up and then we're going to open it up in session together. Marshall Lyles um, gave me that idea. He said, it's like this, you have your fork experience when they open it up. It really is. I even do that with my clinicians in my um, my trainings. And you should see like these clinicians have like everything they need. And somehow they get excited about this little white box with, with modeling magic in it. I'm like, well, it's so neat to see them so happy. But that's the way that it works with kids. And then I tell them right after it's like you've been in my office, let's put that up and bring it out next time. Not so much to where I don't want them playing with it as much as I need them to have it next time. Mm -hmm. I think that's an important distinction. It's not, it's not a, a rule because they can't. It's just that if they yeah. play with it and things start to get lost, then you're, you're well, it's not available then. And if you have an idea in mind of what you're going to be doing, then the activity is missing some of those things or whatnot. 
I want to offer up um, listeners uh, for those of you that, that love this idea and that are also thinking, I'm, I'm not sure I'm in a position where I could mail something to all my clients. Um, one of the things that, that I have done is um, meet with the parent and give them a list and have them either get the list or if there's a, a financial constraint there or it, for whatever reason, it doesn't make sense for them to go out and buy it. I will have them with the child go around the house and put the list together. So they collect the items together and they put that in a box or in a bag or whatever it is. And they create that together as this is my special bag that I bring out when I'm with Lisa. And so that, that can be another, another idea um, for, you know, if you're in a position where you're not able to go and and mail something or send something out is either have the parents get it or have the parent and the child co-create something that really is just for uh, the time that they are with you. So absolutely. Yeah. Gary Landris uh, toy list is really good as a nurturing, expressive and aggressive. But I do have to say like, uh, Leslie Baker, she was on the symposium and she did this construction play where I never even realized all the things you could do with like uh, paper towel rolls and just regular stuff. Exactly. So we don't have to like have all these fancy toys or this expensive toy kit or or anything. We could literally just have them gather their recyclables. I mean, if it's a milk jug or whatever, clean it out. But it, it's fascinating. Kids are so innovative what you can do, you know, with just those things. And my goodness, Dr. Karen Fria. I was literally on her just for now call yesterday with uh, Dr. Oaklander. It, it like it, most amazing. I, I'm at a loss for words. She created this online sand tray, the online puppet show in the online dollhouses phenomenal you just share your screen and some of the sessions that you get throughout that is incredible and on my dollhouses you can make two tabs one for mom's house one for dad's house if they're in a um you know split home situation or the um, sand tray you can save the actual images if you need to you can change it. i know like when i do play therapy and emdr therapy integrated we um need that adaptive shift where in the regular sand tray they can move things around this online sand tray they can make it bigger or smaller and i know dr jessica stone has this virtual sand tray app the dragons actually move their (laughs) wings it's amazing yeah they do so listeners i want you to hear so jackie just threw out like so many resources which tells us that it's possible that and and this is something i want our listeners to wrap our mind around sometimes they get, we get blocked in this feeling of, oh, I can't, oh, it's online. So therefore I can't, I guarantee you can. It's just finding a way to think outside of the constraints of there's a computer screen in front of you, but people are doing it. They are finding ways. So if you're like, I love sand tray and I can't quite figure out how to do it. There are people that have figured it out. Go research it, go, go figure it out. And Also don't limit yourself because I know, for example, let's use the sand tray. One of the coolest things that I have discovered is even with my children that don't necessarily have a sand tray on their end, but I have mine, even a session where the child is telling me what to do and I am moving the the sand tray figurines for them is so amazing or finding creative ways like having them get a dish and use, put cotton balls in it if they don't have sand or, you know, different uh, beans or rice or like there's just different ways of, of doing these things that we love to do in the playroom that we sometimes feel like we can't because we're online. And I, I have not found yet that there's something that I can't do online that I would do in the playroom. I, I'm, I'm guessing you're feeling that same way. Yeah. In fact, finding stuff that I can do that I what that I didn't know. I mean, I think if the tables were turned, we'd get creative and be able to recreate this stuff in the office too. So I think, you know, the big kind of thing there is adaptability and just really kind of go right to your basics. What's really important? The relationship safety, the feeling of safety, and then actual safety, the connectedness. Um, and if you go to what what 
you know, the actual foundational pieces of it are, and you make sure those are in place, regardless of how you're doing it, then you're going to get some good therapy in. Absolutely. I had a session a couple of weeks ago, Jackie, with a little girl who took me out into her garden area and had, uh, she was actually on a, on a phone. She, she logged into zoom through her, through the phone and she had it in the garden and she built a little fairy house in her garden Mm -hmm. while, while, you know, I'm on the other end. And it was like this magical session with me, with her while she is building this. And we're talking about creating protection and safety and for the fairies and a place for them to feel safe. I mean, the metaphor was amazing and it was in a garden in her, in her house. It was so cool. That she can revisit at any time. And it's something that she was led to that had all that meaning. And you were invited in that space. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. (laughs) It was was, was awesome. It was awesome. So (laughs) listeners, I hope that what you're getting from this is to continue. If you're on the fence still about teletherapy, if you're still finding it challenging, for those of you that are doing it and you're finding yourself exhausted, I have really noticed that the more you can make it your, your own, the more you can actually let yourself do what you love naturally doing therapeutically, it goes a long way towards that, um, that exhaustion that we experience on the computer, spending time in the garden with her building her, her little fairy house was invigorating. It was, it it was a different experience than just sitting here, you know, feeling like I'm on a computer, just having a conversation, let yourself be a play therapist, even though there's a, a, a computer in front of you. And this piece that Jackie's talking about, which is take advantage, maybe spend some time thinking about how can I bring things into the teletherapy session that I can't when we are in person and really see if you can take advantage of the fact that you're in their home, that there are other people around, that you have access to their pets, to their stuffies, to their, and, um, and see if you can really let yourself move into the space on a, on a whole other level. And, um, yeah, as I'm saying that Jackie's, do you have any like final words that are coming to mind as, um, yeah, I, I definitely painted as all perfect. And in reality, I experienced I experienced exhaustion and fatigue. And that, that video that we did early on, um, right when the pandemic started on regulation about movement, that was the answer for me. Like if and um, you know, learning through your training too about being authentic, I will actually say like I'm just trying to feel myself get into my blue zone. I feel myself kind of leaning back to my chair. I'm starting to feel a little tired. Let's get up and move and stretch and wiggle. And how about doing some singing? I remember you said you like that song. I'll pull it up on YouTube and share the screen. And we'll pull ourselves back into the green zone. So there's moments where, moments, there's lots of times where I feel fatigued. You know, and I did that in person as well. But just having those um, ways to uh, pull yourself back, pull, pull yourself back into your green zone. And then that's what our clients need, too. So it goes right back to authenticity. Just it kind does. of. <laughs> and then we're co-regulating in that moment and, and modeling for them. So, uh, Jackie, the resource that you just mentioned, the one that you and I recorded um, early on in the pandemic, where can individuals find that? If you go to YouTube and you just put in the search, Lisa, Regulation, and Jackie, you'll see it. It'll pop up. So there's another resource for for all of you. We really talk about um, the the fatigue and we really talk about how to regulate and what that means and how to step into that a little bit, a little bit more, which does. It comes back to authenticity. Do what you love. Find a way to make this meaningful. Regulate your regulate your nervous system. Co-regulate with your co-regulate with your clients. Um, Be human online. Don't need to be robotic. Be human. <laughs> yes. And have water next to you. I know in that video, we like demonstrate it. Having water to drink, being hydrated is important. Moving. I, I like play with toys and I, I just spin around in my chair. All kinds of, all kinds of stuff that incorporates movement and fluids. 
I have a drawer at my desk and the entire drawer is filled with things that I can squish in my hand, pull, stretch. I keep a weighted blanket. Um, if I need to put weighted blanket on my legs and my feet, um, sometimes I will, you know, move my feet back and forth. Like they're on a balance board, but keeping that activation in the body is absolutely huge in teletherapy. Remember play therapists that when we're in the playroom um, in person, we're, you know, we're reaching for this and we're stretching over here and we're standing up to walk over and get the glitter and we're, and we're naturally moving. And don't let that part go away in your teletherapy sessions. You still need to move because the movement is part of what keeps you connected to your bodies and children move. So they need you to move with them too. So. Oh, that's so good. And just real quick on the blanket, um, Dr. Bryson, when she was on the symposium, she talked about like that safety of having the client have a blanket with them, a blanket. And if they could have something warm to drink, just that physiological felt of like warmth and connection and the weight that can make a huge difference in your sessions too, which I didn't really think about that. But now I tell that since she uh, mentioned that in the interview, I tell the parents, say if they could have a, like a nice uh, blanket that they like close to them. And if, you know, you, they do like, you know, some of them like to drink tea or hot chocolate, maybe not hot chocolate, but something that creates that sense of coziness that can help pull them out of their um, red zones because some of them get nervous. I mean, I get nervous in sessions sometimes, so I know they must feel it yes. too if they feel overactivated. Well, and then they're also pairing that warm felt sense with you yeah. Yeah. and with, with their, that with therapy, that therapy now has this, this, uh, this, yeah, warm felt sense quality attached to it and it can be nurturing. It doesn't have to be this scary thing. So that's beautiful. That can get paired in the brain as well. Mm. Well, yeah. Jack, I feel like you and I could just keep talking and talking and talking. Um, I am so, again, grateful. I shared at the beginning of this that in my mind, this has been like a countdown to, to get you on here to have a, have a conversation. Um, you really are. You're doing so many amazing things out there. Play Therapist, please check out her podcast. And please, every year, make sure that you are keeping your eyes and your ears open um, for the Child Therapy um, Symposium. It, it really is. How many um, people did you interview this year? This year was 34 and last year was 41. I mean, my goodness. And, and we're talking about big names in the field, folks, but the big, big names. So it's amazing. Thank you so much for your dedication to the field and what you're doing to bring knowledge and information to, to people also around the world, helping, helping them work with kids and families. So Jackie, thank you so much for being here. Thank new. you. <laughs> Thank you. And I haven't, I haven't had a chance to tell you yet, but I love your training. I love, love it. And Lindsay, I'm working with her through consultation. Oh my goodness. It's changed everything. I wish I would have gotten that right out of grad school, but I, I haven't get it Listeners, sign up for our introduction to synergetic play therapy courses. <laughs> really, it really is incredible. I mean, um, all jokes aside, I mean, it's like it's not only helping with just my kid clients; it's helping me um, overall, like as a person. But I'm able to connect deeper with people, and they feel it. I feel it. It's yeah. it's really taking it to the just that extra depth, and we're getting some really good work done. Awesome, Jackie. Thank you so very much. Thank you. All right, listeners, let's all take a deep breath together. Tune in, connect with yourself here for, for just a moment as I remind you to continue to take care of yourselves because you are the most important toy in that playroom, even if the playroom is online. For more information on our courses and our classes, please go to our website at synergeticplaytherapy.com and check out what we have available to you. And as always, remember that you're the most important toy in that playroom. <laughs>